Right, good afternoon everyone. I will get started and then people can join us. I see people are still joining the meeting, but we don't want to overrun beyond two o'clock. So I'll get beginning and it, I just say it gives me very great pleasure to welcome you to the final talk of Trinity Term in our lunchtime fellowship seminar series. And in fact, it's the final of 12 talks that we've had throughout the academic year for a term. So our speaker this week is uh, Dr. Ricardo Perez de la Fuente. Uh, Ricardo is a junior research fellow in paleobiology at St. Eben Hall, and he's also a museum research fellow at the Oxford University Museum of Natural History. Ricardo did his, uh, his PhD in Barcelona, and then he did a five-year postdoc in the museum at Harvard, and he joined Teddy Hall in 2017 when he was appointed to his museum research fellowship. Ricardo's research, so we've gone, we've gone right the way across the spectrum of the subjects this year. So Ricardo's research is focused on the paleobiology of fossil arthropods, namely insects and arachnids. Um, so those who have a spider phobia, this possibly might be an interesting talk, to, but at least they're in case in amber, amber this time around, because his emphasis is about the study of these animals in amber, and particularly those from the Cretaceous uh, geological period. He has already published really extensively, and I would urge you to read some of his publications. They are absolutely fascinating, absolutely fascinating the work he's been doing. So without further ado, I will now hand over to Fernando to talk on Amber Time Stood Still. Fernando. Hi everyone. Thank you so much, Cathy, for that uh, lovely introduction. Let me start sharing my screen. All right, and I take that at this point, uh, all of you should be... Yeah, we can see it. Nice, nice. Uh, so thanks so much again, Kathy, for that introduction. Thank you to Andrew for the invitation, of course, to the rest of you as well, and Claire as well for the arrangements. It's a great ple pleasure to be here uh, today. And first of all, as a Spaniard, I'm well aware of the fact that uh, summer and post lunch time equals siesta. Uh, so hopefully I'll manage to keep you awake throughout the talk, but if not, please uh, let it go. Uh, the bond that it's created between somebody who, uh, between you know, being able to put somebody to sleep is a strong one and a beautiful one as well. So I uh, wanted to say that, but hopefully I'll manage to keep you uh, awake throughout the talk. All right, so in this talk, we'll aim to answer uh, some questions. Um, uh, they go from more general to more specific ones. For instance, why are fossils important? And what is amber and what makes it special? Where is amber found? How is amber extracted and prepared? And what can be uh, studied and learned from fossils preserved in amber? Now, I would like to start with a very powerful analogy that was uh, already used by uh, Carl Sagan in uh, this cosmos series, right? Uh, and that's the, the calendar. So if we were to fit the 4.6 billion years uh, of the history of Earth in a calendar so that they fit 30 days, uh, the first rocks formed by, or at least the ones that we, we know of, formed by uh, day five, the fifth day of the Earth history calendar. Now, the first, uh, signs of life, of course, uh, microscopic, very simple, uh, appeared in the fossil record or appeared by the eighth day of uh, this Earth history calendar. Uh, from there, we have this almost three weeks of, uh, uh, let's say, um, time in which life stayed microcellular uh, and, 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 and uh, simple for our standards, right? Until 27th day in which we can get the first um, um, fossils from multicellular organisms. Here we have uh, Charnia, this uh, uh, beautiful animal from the Idiacaran. Now organisms, um, some of them iconic, such as trilobites and arthropods and many of the, of the clades that of animals a list that exists today uh, appeared by 28th day of this Earth history calendar. 
uh, a dinosaurs, uh, the non-avian dinosaurs by the 29th. And uh, then in the last day of the, his the Earth's history calendar, um, it, things get um, uh, exciting. It's true that because we have a, um, usually a better record of that time, right? Because it's the closest to us. But in that last day, uh, the ancestors of birds appeared one minute after midnight of this uh, uh, last day or the first minute of that day, right? Flowering plants are thought to have appeared by 5 a.m. in that last day of the Earth history calendar. Bats, such an iconic animals, at 4 p.m. and only about 30 minutes to midnight from the last day, our, um, our ancestors, Homo, um, appeared in the fossil record. And it's only three minutes to midnight that our very own species uh, appeared uh, back in time. Here in the, we have some beautiful uh, specimens of Homo sapiens. Now, uh, with all, all of this is that in order to approach the complexity of uh, the Earth history and concepts or a phenomena such as uh, evolution itself, the most direct means that we have at our disposal are, are fossils, fossil record. And that's why the fossil record is such an important um, uh, element. Um, and basically one that uh, nourishes many, many fields in if not all of them. Now, of course, fossils, we have uh, different types of fossils of many different kinds. Uh, here, we, I will just showcase a few of them. This is one of the most iconic uh, Archaeopteryx from the Jurassic of Germany. Uh, it's among the earliest the, um, uh, birds in a wide sense. So feathered theropods, feathered dinosaurs. And it was a fossil that uh, changed many conceptions on um, dinosaur and bird evolution. Of course, aside from animals and skeletons, which is what we tend to think of when we think about paleontology, right? Fossils. Um, plants, the fossil record of plants is also a very um, significant one. Here's an exceptional uh, fossil forest from Hungary, which is Miocene. Um, and it's composed of taxodium um, stumps that are still in the original position in which they fossilized. Um, things as incredible as this are being discovered um, uh, occasionally. But aside from uh, what we could call body fossils, fossils of the entire organism, or at least a significant part of it, the fossil record also provides um, other types of fossils. For instance, one of the most abundant are what we call produced fossil remains, which are uh, those elements that one organism keep producing uh, throughout uh, its life. Here, for instance, we have um, teeth, uh, skeleton, uh, sorry, short teeth, and some fossil leaves. But of course, there's, aside from these uh, direct remains from the organisms, we also have trace fossils, which are the result of the activity of the organisms. Here are some uh, footprints, and also uh, in this example, here is something less common, which are uh, borings, uh, traces of um, uh, punctures made by uh, sponges on an oyster shell. So uh, this provides some of the um, diversity of fossils that can be found in the fossil record. Each of them provide different type of information. Uh, that is very useful uh, in order for us to reconstruct the ecosystem or how these organisms lived. Uh, some, something important about taking into account is that the fossil record is usually um, um, preserving hardened, mineralized parts of the organisms because those were the most resistant to decay. And of course, the most uh, classic examples of this are um, bones and also the shells or the uh, outer skeletons of some invertebrates here and ammonite. But in some occasions, uh, the, the 
soft parts from the organisms can also be preserved. And normally the conditions entail um, the lack of oxygen, which of course enhances uh, decay. Uh, so in, in this case, uh, here in the example, we have uh, two beautiful frogs. And aside from the, from the bones, we also have preserved some of the um, soft parts, so sometimes including in the internal organs. And here is where I wanted to arrive. Um, amber provides a very special type of exceptional preservation where uh, the soft tissues are also preserved, although in a very special way that uh, we'll now see. But so amber is fossilized plant resin. Um, this resin, once is produced by uh, a very wide variety of, of um, plant sources, hardens and gets more or less sticky. And, and during that time, it has the ability to entrap different organisms or their parts. Uh, once that uh, a particular piece of resin uh, potentially entrapping organisms um, hardens and falls to the forest floor, at some point it can get uh, gathered by um, floods or um, dense, um, rain. And during that time, the natural process is for it to go downstream and then deposit in areas where the water has lost the, that energy, right? Like uh, deltas uh, where the, or basically the areas where the river, uh, where rivers meet the, uh, the sea. And of course, there are also sediments that tend to be very soft. Uh, sometimes those sediments end up burying uh, those resin pieces in a relatively fast way. And here's when the fossilization process can start, so we can uh, those pieces can bury. Now, with the passing of a few million years, those resin pieces start losing volatile compounds, and within two, one or two million years, uh, that piece of resin transform, transforms into what we understand as amber, thanks to, of course, uh, the um, rays of pressure and the temperature that a burial entails. Of course, most of you would be aware of the amber and the fact that um, it preserves many different organisms inside through Jurassic Park. I was definitely hooked into, into this partly uh, because of uh, Jurassic Park as well. As you recall, in Jurassic Park, the, um, uh, they were able to extract DNA from mosquitoes preserved in amber, uh, and then they cloned using that uh, DNA, they cloned the, uh, the dinosaurs. First of all, cloning uh, from basically fragmentary DNA information would be an incredible challenge by itself, but we have not even been able to extract DNA from a number of creatures yet. Actually, Jurassic Park was based on a real, uh, on real research that claimed to have extracted DNA from, uh, from a mosquito preserved in Dominican Republic amber, but later, uh, the research was tried to uh, be replicated and that was impossible. So uh, they concluded it must have been a contamination. But Jurassic Park was actually based on real science, uh, which I thought it was interesting. Now, the, one of the most special things about amber, about this uh, fossilized plant resin, is that it preserves um, tissues and structures in an incredible detail, pretty much unmatched in paleontology. Here we have a beautiful example of an uh, Eocene um, insect larva. It's a lace wing larva. It's actually, you can see how all the crazy spines and, and hair-like structures, CT, have been preserved here. But what makes the amber record really, really special is that the resin was able to preserve life in action because it captured little bits of the ecosystem almost instantly. And that's something that's really, actually that it's pretty much, pretty much unmatched by any other fossiliferous material. So here in the examples, we have some swarms. This is a, an ant swarm. Um, um, in theory, nuptial swarms occur 
for um, in order for insects to find a mate, a reproductive mate. Here, actually, we, we see two, two flies mating. Here, in this example over here, we have a mite that is attached to an insect. Some mites are predatory, so feed on insects, but some others just use them as a carriers. And so this one was getting a free ride. Or this over here, we actually have parasitic nematodes leaving the boat, so to speak, once that insect got trapped in resin and therefore it was suffocating. So um, as you can see, our can tell us very, very interesting stories on what was going on in the paleo ecosystem. And that's what, and that is what really makes Amber special. Of course, Amber provides an incredible array and diversity of uh, organisms or their parts. Mostly those, those uh, parts or organisms are arthropods because those were, um, aside from being very abundant in the ecosystem, uh, winged insects were very highly mobile and therefore the chances for them to uh, get in contact with the fresh resin were also higher, right? All of these examples are from Cretaceous Amber uh, from Spain, which is the one that I've studied most. Amber comes in all colors, and of course, the most common one are we're talking about these um, yellows or oranges, sometimes reds. But amber can actually also be milky, even white in color, due to content in micro bubbles, or even have some crazy, crazy colors, such as this blue violet one uh, in this amber from from Spain. Uh, this actually due to a fluorescence that was. Uh, through through compounds that were already present in the original resin and probably the, the therefore in the uh, resiniferous plant, but that somehow also uh, modified throughout uh, fossilization. Now, uh, the first amber known uh, comes from the Carboniferous about uh, around 300 million years ago, but that amber is actually really, really scarce and has not provided uh, fossil content yet. Now, the first amber fossils are known from the Triassic, about around 200, between 200 and 250 million years. Uh, but those who are also very, very scarce will see some examples. Now, it's not until the Cretaceous that amber and also fossiliferous amber, therefore amber containing abundant and diverse fossils, becomes also uh, pervasive in the fossil record. We'll see some of these examples now. So this is uh, one example from this uh, amber from the Carboniferous, and it's from the Illinois. And again, we're talking about very, very small amber pieces uh, that do not contain uh, fossils. In the late Triassic, um, these amber pits are very, very small, very scarce, but some of them have been found containing amber inclusions, like one fly over here and one mite. Uh, the authors, though, spent a lot of time going through thousands of amber bits like this one over here, which, as you can see, have actually, they keep the shape of the original resin flow, right? Therefore, they show signs of, of gravity. Um, but um, um, they were not able to find any other fossils aside from this two. In the Cretaceous, though, amber becomes basically very common or relatively common. And some of the main amber outcrops in the world come from these areas over here, from Canada, from Siberia, in Russia, and New Jersey, in the US, France, Spain, Lebanon, and Myanmar, right? And in this talk, we'll mostly focus on, on the Cretaceous amber from Spain. Uh, like I mentioned, is the one that I've studied most. But first of, uh, um, before that, I wanted to include some a brief mention of Cretaceous amber in the UK. The UK amber uh, has been found in the Isle of Wight and uh, Sussex, but in very very small um, quantities. And for instance, the Isle of Wight, a couple of uh, fossils were found, like this a spider over here, which, by the way, is going to be the only spider that I'm, that I'm going to be showcasing, Kathy. So, uh, spider, uh, uh, sadly, haters would be um, uh, pleased to hear about that. 
and also a, a small, I believe this is a small uh, midget, midget over here. And then, but the Amber of Sussex, um, no macro only small ones such as uh, spider uh, web threads. In Spain, uh, the Amber is found in such in, in, a, in a sort of uh, curve that actually corresponds to the uh, coastal line back in the Cretaceous. Um, about 100 million years ago, the Iberian Peninsula was still an island being separated from the rest of uh, the, what, what is now the euro, what is now Europe, right? And therefore, uh, the sea, the paleocoastal line, the sea arrived in this area. And therefore, the amber, the resin was depositing in these delta storing environments that we've uh, previously seen. So this is how a number outcrop looks like. This is in Cantabria in Northern Spain. And uh, it's actually very different from what we tend to think when it, we think about a an, an, uh, fossil outcrop, right? Because we tend to think about dinosaurs, desert. Well, not this one. We have a lovely uh, road here. Actually, the, out, the outcrop was discovered because of the uh, construction work on the road. So uh, in the number of excavation, uh, of course, amber tends to be found in such um, uh, soft rocks, such as mudstones, sometimes with some uh, sandstones. And it can actually be very fun to excavate amber, particularly if it rains, right? Which, you know, it's actually very common in Northern Spain. Uh, the climate is actually quite similar to, to the one here. So amber can be extracted manually using regular tools and different shorts uh, types of amber pieces can be extracted from small ones, still preserving the original shape, of the uh, um, which they were produced to uh, bigger, larger pieces. Some, some of them showing actually what we think are the scars from the original bark from the resin producing trees or much larger amber uh, pieces. Uh, those actually we think that were produced by roots uh, underground and therefore they, don't, they do not tend, tend to contain uh, inclusions and uh, fossils. But aside from manual extraction, during the exhibitions, we use uh, a, a magical device that's not only um, useful for construction, but also uh, in paleontology, at least for number of excavations, which is the concrete mixer. So uh, what we do is actually we wash the rocks containing the amber uh, inside the concrete mixers, and amber floats in, in water, at least that um, with um, other solids in suspension, right? And we only we need to uh, wash that uh, rock and then separate, extract the amber bits uh, using sieves. Even the tiniest bit of amber can actually contain uh, uh, an amazing uh, inclusion. So every single bit counts. And that's why, why this work is so uh, time consuming. Uh, other ways that uh, we have to extract uh, amber. This one might seem not particularly accurate, but it's actually very effective. Sometimes we directly wash the, uh, the outcrop or at least some prospection holes. Uh, we wash them with, with water, right? So in this example over here, uh, this is the prospection hole. And at the end of it, we had put some sieves so that all, all the material goes down uh, by gravity and gets retained here in these uh, sieves. I was actually not very sure at this at first, of course, as a, as a student, but uh, we've, we were able actually to retrieve very delicate amber pieces with this system. Uh, so it actually works. But that's only one side of the, of, the, of the process, right? After amber has gathered in the field, now a very, very time consuming process of preparing the amber starts. So here we have, our technician, technician Rafael Lopez del Valle, uh, whose uh, hands are uh, magical. And uh, Amber is prospected first for inclusions. Once the inclusions have been detected, those Amber pieces need to be polished in order to um, get the inclusion, the fossil, as close to the surface of the Amber piece as possible, right? So that the specimen can be best studied. That what we do is that we include those amber pieces inside artificial um, resin bits. Uh, it's the best way actually to first preserve the amber because amber is 
surprisingly fragile. It has spent millions of years underground, but once we unearth it, it, uh, it breaks down very easily. It, uh, it's very fragile. But also sometimes that artificial infilling with resin fills internal cracks and therefore improves the visibility of the inclusions. So we have here, we have one of the uh, resulting um, uh, preparations that uh, Rafa, Rafa did. And so once we have our lovely amber preparations, thanks to the work of our, our uh, technicians, uh, at least and that's how we operate in our research team, we mostly study uh, um, uh, the beasts, those organisms using classic techniques. So we still draw a lot. Drawings are very important for us because uh, it allows us to uh, interpret the structures of the fossil in order to uh, properly describe it, right? Uh, but aside from that classic side, uh, we've been also using um, some um, top-notch techniques or um, some modern techniques, like using um, X-rays in the synchrotron. The synchrotron, as most of you um, might know, are these facilities. Uh, this one is in uh, here in Oxfordshire, Diamond. And what they do is that they basically accelerate the, they are particle accelerators, so they accelerate the electrons, and those electrons then they are projected through different experimental cabins, and it can be used for a multiple uh, aims based on changing the characteristics of the, those beams of light. Right? Uh, here's actually how uh, each of these experimental cabins that we've seen earlier looks like within the ring of the, the external ring of the synchrotron. And now we'll see one of these internal uh, experiments inside one of these experimental cabins. Here uh, in this space over here is where, where the beam of light uh, gets through and hits our sample over here. Here's the detector uh, for those uh, for the beam of light when it has been um, uh, modified um, differentially by our sample. And here we have our sample here, an amber piece. In this case, we had put an, an an amber ant, and here's the way that amber ant was being seen live as the x-rays were um, um, going through the tissues of this fossil. This fossil is about 40 million years old from Baltic amber. And therefore, the amazing thing about this technique is that it can be used to visualize uh, fossils that wouldn't, wouldn't be otherwise. For instance, those preserved in opaque amber, those that are very, very, very small, like this fairy fly over here, which is actually wasp, and sometimes actually can even allow us to make virtual cuts of the specimens and see what's preserved inside. Uh, sometimes we've been able to find muscles or nervous system thanks to this technique. So it's uh, entailed a huge step forward uh, for paleontology. Now, in the, in the second half of uh, this talk, I would like to, for the remaining uh, 20 minutes, I would like to focus on uh, five case studies on Cretaceous Amber so that I can hopefully uh, showcase uh, the potential of Amber uh, in order to reconstruct the ecosystems and tell us about ancient uh, organisms. So we will first uh, see uh, debris carrying in lacewing uh, larvae, which is actually among my favorite topics. Uh, so I apologize if uh, any of you already know about this. I already talk about it all the time. So uh, green lacewings are these uh, um, beautiful creatures, these beautiful insects that are that have wings, uh, as if they had been um, um, made by lace. Uh, right, so the, hence their uh, their common name. So adults look like this, like these beautiful creatures, but larvae, their immatures, uh, look completely different. Right, this is something that is actually um, shared by uh, holometabolous insects or insects with metamorphosis. Right, but in the case of uh, green lace wings or lace wings in general, neuropterans in general, the larvae looks very fierce. They are actually predators, and they have this sickle shaped mouth that they use to pierce their prey and suck their fluids, right? Uh, now, something interesting about uh, green lacing larvae is that some of them, uh, they show this uh, really amazing um, behavior by which they cover themselves using different material that uh, they uh, 
locate and then they hoard over their bodies uh, in, in an active fashion. So and in order to do so, they possess uh, this like uh, um, these tubes or little humps that have hair-like structures seated. Uh, these are marked here in the with the red um, arrows. Now these tubes, these tubercles with CT, have show or show a different development throughout the extant diversity of the group. But it turns out that they are never much larger than, uh, than the ones shown here, and that's something important uh, because uh, of what we'll see uh, now following. Like I mentioned, um, some green lacewing larvae. Um, hoard different materials that they find in their environment. Uh, they have this debris carrying uh, behavior. And you know they can actually carry very different uh, sort of materials. Uh, for instance, those can include uh, pieces of bark or pieces of soil. Uh, here we even see some uh, land animals having been incorporated to this, uh, to this uh, a debris packet, as, as we call it, or even remains of their prey as well. Uh, in this example over here, though, we have plant trichomes, uh, these hair-like structures that plants have for protection or also keeping humidity. Right Now, this uh, debris packet provides not only camouflage, but also a physical shield that these larvae can use against their predators. So it has this twofold approach. Now, this is the uh, fossil that we found in Spanish amber. And it is, of course, an, a relative of modern green lace wings uh, or the larvae. Here, we see their characteristic sickle-shaped sickle mouthboards. Uh, the fossil, though, has a very weird shape of head, banana shape, which is not something that can be found among modern relatives, for instance. Now, something very interesting about this if we actually uh, eliminate this very strange cloud of stuff that surrounds the fossil, is that uh, the fossil has these super long tubes that are attached to the body. They are not the legs. And those tubes have hair-like structures, CT, uh, like the mother relatives, right? Um, but there's nothing very interesting about those CT, and that and is that those CT show, at the very end of them, a trumpet-shaped expansion. That is something that is not shown in modern relatives. Modern relatives have different ways in which they actually increase their retaining potential for the elements or of the uh, trash or the debris packet, sorry, such as they can have hooklets at the end or those city can have serrations, right? But none of them had actually, none of the modern relatives have such an uh, expansions at the end of the city. Now, once we've seen the fossil itself of the, of the lace wing, we, if, we, if we focus on those filaments that surround it, um, we can see how these were actually, or we identify them as plant trichomes. Uh, here's one of those filaments. And if we zoom into them, we can see how these filaments have actually a very uh, conspicuous wall that corresponded to the cell wall of the trichome. And they even have some ornamentation. So we, of course, we uh, studied those filaments and we saw also different developments of them uh, corresponding to the different um, times during the differentiation process of the trichomes. And those trichomes would have been, um, been got stuck between those uh, trumpet-shaped endings from the seed, right? So it's, that was actually uh, most likely an adaptation for retaining the, the trichomes. We actually think that those trichomes belong to ferns. And here's a reconstruction of our beast. Uh, here you can see this crazy array of uh, tubes that we have created like a, like a basket, right? Into which our uh, fossil lace wing uh, likely or, or placed those trichomes uh, using active movements. After that one, we actually studied uh, some additional uh, larva, larvae of this kind. This is one from Lebanese amber. And uh, this one, again, 
we can see these different tubes. Uh, they are depicted in different colors depending on their positioning. And instead of having trumpet shaped endings, this one has much mushroom shaped endings. So it's a bit different. And aside from other uh, characteristics, right? But it's something interesting uh, that it shares that feature with, uh, with the Spanish specimen. And this one actually, instead of trichomes, was hoarding something different, something that we interpreted as soil fragments. Uh, now, it's very interesting, right? Because uh, 100 million years ago, the ancestors of modern green lace wing larvae were using pretty much equivalent elements than extant larvae do today to create this trash um, or this debris packet, right? Such as trichomes and soil fragments here. This one, uh, this larva uh, looks almost like a tank, right? Uh, with that uh, covering of soil particles. So that was the first study. The second one uh, is going to be dealing with uh, pollination of gymnosperms uh, mediated by insects. So, insect pollination is, of course, or showcases one of the most pervasive interactions in, um, in, the, in, in nature. And, and it's therefore, it's, it's very interesting to look at it from an evolutionary perspective, right? Using the fossil record again. And I will focus on, on, on instances of direct evidence of pollination that we found in the Cretaceous Amber from Spain. Those were actually among the first um, instances of um, insects carrying pollen that they were described from Amber. Afterwards, many, or many others have been described so we see these three groups over here, thrips, uh, flies, long proboscid flies, and beetles. Uh, in the first group are thrips. These are uh, very peculiar insects. It's actually a, a whole order of uh, insects themselves. And they're characterized among, among many other characteristics by possessing these uh, strip-like wings with a fringe of CD or, or hair-like structures, right? Thrips are nowadays, uh, although you know it's not a, a particularly large group of insects, okay, they can actually be significant pollinators today. In this example over here, they are poly, uh, pollinating, they're feeding on the, on the pollen and therefore as pollinating as well uh, some uh, cycads, this one in, from Australia, right? Now, my colleagues in this case, I, I didn't part in this particular um, uh, study over here, they found pollen attached to some uh, Cretaceous thrips. Here you can see uh, this pollen over here. Uh, more than 100 uh, individual grains were identified. The type of pollen was also identified and leaving a few uh, possible um, plant producers. And the, the, the CT from these insects even showed some peculiar specializations that uh, were probably related to increasing the retaining potential for those uh, pollen grains. Second group are the, these long proboscid flies, these flies with long proboscides, um, uh, which among extant relatives are used to feed on nectar, right? But um, in this particular specimen, we found a clump of pollen in the abdomen of this fly. And we were also able to identify uh, the, the pollen grains. This time, this, this, time, this time, these pollen grains were donut shaped. And the third instance is this um, beetle over here, beetles. In this, in this case, um, most of the, of the um, pollen grains were actually forming a trail um, um, corresponding to, to the movement of the, of the specimen in the, in the still fresh resin, right? Uh, although in this specimen over here, there are still a few um, uh, areas or a few pollen grains still attached to the, to the specimen. That means that we have direct evidence of, of pollination, right? Which is something um, that pretty much only amber can provide. For the, for the flying specimen though, aside from direct evidence, we can always, we can always approach the, the matter through indirect means, right? Uh, using morphology, which is most part of the time what we are stuck with in paleontology after all, right? So our fly over here, it possesses uh, this structure over here called uh, the labellum, which is actually very common in flies, right? But this structure over here showcases many, many different branchings that are used to imbibe uh, liquids, uh, in this case, nectar-like secretions, right? And that is actually a way um, these uh, insects have to 
at least passively uh, suck nectar-like fluids. Uh, they have active mechanisms like pumps, right, on their, on their heads. Uh, but this is at least an, an indirect one. And aside from that, we are actually able to extract a cat from one of those proboscides from a different uh, um, slow proboscid fly belonging to the same species. And we actually were able to analyze the internal structure, the cross-section of this, um, this proboscid. And that cross-section or the, the structure of it was compatible with a proboscid that was able to feed on nectar-like secretions. Aside from that, that our flies also had a uh, wing venation that uh, shows characteristics of having been able to uh, provide hovering. Uh, in our case, uh, the venation is compacted towards the, the leading edge of the wing. Uh, so this is the way we reconstructed our fly, our uh, long fly, about to be feeding on uh, the nectar-like secretions of ovulate structures. Now, it turns out that all of those cases that I've shown the pollen grains belong to gymnosperms. Now, this is very interesting, right? Uh, because we're talking about about 105 million years ago. And during that time, something very interesting was taking place, which is the radiation of angiosperms, of flowering plants. Uh, now, of course, when we think about pollination, uh, or insect pollination, we tend to think about angiosperms. And when we think about gymnosperms, non-flowering plants, such as conifers, we tend to think that these are pollinated, namely by wind mostly, right? And that's actually the case nowadays. But in the past, and particularly since we've been ex encountering different examples of insects pollinating gymnosperms, we thought that uh, that was very different, obviously. And that uh, about in the Cretaceous, about 100 million years ago, uh, insects were pollinating gymnosperms in quite a pervasive way. And that actually, uh, in a way, kind of prepared the, the terrain for or maybe did so for the angiosperm flowering plants to take over. Um, so that's something that still require um, research and that many other instances of pollination, including those uh, insects carrying angiosperm pollen have been, have been found lately. So let's move on. Uh, next, we will showcase ticks as uh, parasites of endomenosaurs. So in this study over here, uh, we describe uh, the first direct evidence of um, the, uh, the fact that ticks parasitize feather dinosaurs. Now that had been actually suggested formally, right? Based on finding ticks in Cretaceous amber, but um, never before uh, a tick had been found in direct attachment to, to, uh, to a feather, right? So in this uh, example over here, uh, this uh, specimen is from Burmese, Burmese amber, which is slightly younger than Spanish amber. This uh, mature tick was um, uh, clasping a, a, a feather. Um, so it's very interesting actually here because in the feather, we, the feather also shows the microstructure right, preserved thanks to the, to the amazing amber preservation. Sometimes we even find hooklets in, in, the, in feathers, those hooklets, what they do is that they connect uh, little branches of the feathers with one another. And therefore, they, in, for some types of feather, they have the potential to create a uh, closed surface uh, or mates, right? Uh, so that's something that uh, can be actually important in order to recognize different types of feather. Nonetheless, though, we had uh, a problem with our finding, which is that uh, the structure of the feather was not allowing us to pinpoint a particular dinosaur host. Uh, as you know, there's were a part of dinosaurs, uh, the theropod uh, lineage developed uh, feathers, which are integumentary structures such as our hair, right? And, but the, 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 the development of such um, feathers um, is different depending on the, on the lineage of uh, theropods, right? Of these uh, feathered dinosaurs. But we were not able to tell which one. Now, uh, something was almost certainly based on the fossil record. And is that our feather, this feather over here, did not belong to modern birds because those appeared much later uh, in the fossil record, at least about 30 million years later. Aside from uh, this particular um, specimen of tick grasping a feather, we also analyzed other specimens. 
Here, actually, we describe a new family of ticks, an exclusively extinct uh, group of ticks um, preserved also in, 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 in Burmese amber. And those ticks are, um, or, or, or different, another one of those ticks was uh, engorged with uh, blood. And we, we made some attempts or trying to identify, detect that. Uh, we have not been successful as of yet, but we'll keep trying, right? But uh, we actually had uh, um, direct evidence that those ticks were substantially feeding, right? Uh, this is the reconstruction, sorry, the reconstruction of these ticks. The, we have here the construction of, uh, of, uh, of the male and, a, and an engorged female over here. Uh, as you can see, actually, ticks can grossly sometimes increase their volume, right? Increase in waste. This one, though, not as much as modern hard ticks. Hard ticks can increase their volume up to 100 times, right? It was in this case of our new group of ticks. Interesting uh, bit, though, is that our ticks also have indirect evidence of ticks parasitizing feathered hosts. Uh, it turns out that in the areas that have been marked here are uh, these ticks, these Danocrotonic ticks, which means something like a uh, terrible tick or something, that's the name we, we used. Uh, they had attached to, to them these structures over here. Now these structures were very were puzzling to us uh, for I would say many months, even years. We actually thought that at first that those were actually feathers because um, the barbules, the, 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 the smallest uh, division of feathers, actually look very similar to this, except they do not have this uh, terminal head, so to speak. Now, in the end, we were able to, we were able, thanks to our colleagues, to recognize those structures as specialized CT from a type of beetle called dermestids or skin beetles. Now, Probably most of you or some of you will know their mastids because are actually among the number one enemy of collections because they eat um, uh, uh, keratinized tissues such as skin, feathers, or hair. So they can actually cause really uh, serious problems among collections. So of course, the museum is one of the, the number one enemies, right? That we have to um, um, take care of. Uh, so it turns out that. Uh, and those CT are actually specialized to create uh, mats that they in um, that they trap the potential predators of these larva larvae. Uh, so I have to say that these are the larvae the immatures of these dermestids, right? So those uh, CT, such specialized CT. Uh, sorry, I have to mention that because dermestids feed on those. Um, materials, skin feathers, hair, they are nowadays relatively commonly found in uh, nests for vertebrates, right? Therefore, finding of such hairs in a six, uh, most likely place them in, in a nest environment uh, about 100 million years ago. And therefore, and this is an indirect evidence of these ticks having been, having parasitized uh, feathered uh, dinosaurs as well. And now uh, I'm almost done. I will go uh, and try to uh, process this in two, three minutes. I just wanted also to provide a different view, right? We've seen kind of relatively flashy fossils now, but we also study um, uh, other types of fossils of inclusions in it. Uh, one type of this, uh, provide a view the introduction of this. So these uh, fossils were here, uh, preserved in, in amber. Uh, were first identified as protists, therefore as microorganisms. Um, it was actually very puzzling um, because of the lack of characters, right, of structures um, through which we could identify this, um, this um, uh, unicellular um, or these um, microorganisms in this case. Not necessarily unicellular, but microorganisms, uh, microscopic in size. Now, some studies uh, after the one that I showed earlier identified that actually those um, inclusions were artifacts. They did not correspond to microorganisms at all. Well, in, and further studies actually um, said that somehow they were related, related to, the, to, the, to the production of uh, resin in the, um, in the tree, right? In the original tree. 
Now we studied some amber pieces um, like this one that internally show flows, some banding patterns like this. Now these banding patterns are actually formed by uh, microbe-like inclusions, like the ones that we've seen earlier, right? And we have layers that are deformed and undeformed, uh, undeformed inside these amber pieces. Now it turns out that once the, um, the inclusions that are in undeformed amber layers, they are also undeformed and have disappeared. And the ones, the inclusions that are inside those deformed layers are equally deformed uh, in, in, a, in a single plane, right? So they are here um, uh, constricted in one direction. Now, we identified two types of substances here, a light matter inside the back walls and a dark matter outside. And therefore we have the amber matrix, right? So they have these two substances that we were working with originally. Through some uh, fluorescent uh, studies, those that light matter inside the inclusions had the same um, uh, fluorescence than the amber itself. And therefore it was also amber. So we had those inclusions being made of amber and something else that we call the dark matter, right? Here providing some fluorescence in red. Also, there were these uh, mineralized sub-inclusions inside the dark matter. Through some studies, less, such as microraman spectroscopy, we identified that the dark matter had sugar residues. And here we have uh, the profiles of some uh, sugars over here. And we had some peaks as well in the dark matter. Inside the mineralized sub-inclusions of the dark matter, we identified some the presence of several inorganic ions through some electron microprobe analysis. Now, all of that data and some other allows us to identify that uh, the dark matter was actually fossilized sap, flowing sap. As you know, sap is a different liquid or a different uh, substance than resin, although they can be quite similar in appearance. And the sap transports water and nutrients uh, for the plant, right? And therefore, uh, we identified our um, the microbe-like inclusions, these inclusions, and that we had inside our inside our pieces, as emulsions of sap and resin that had been fossilized. And the defining moment was when we actually found water, water in oil, in water emulsions uh, from uh, papers published by uh, physicists and chemists having pretty much the same appearance than, than our inclusions. So now actually we can, we can study uh, how resin was produced and the circumstances that happened thanks to the study of, this, uh, of these inclusions. So I hope I've, I've been able to answer to uh, all, if not most of the questions and about all that uh, I managed not to, uh, to keep you awake throughout, throughout it. Uh, here's some of some of the, my own work cited in case afterwards somebody wants to take a look at them. Uh, thank you so much to all these people and institutions uh, that have supported me and support my research team. And uh, thank you all so much. <laughs>